Hey, ghost ghoulies and entities of the paranormal, this is American Shock Rocker Demon Boy, and you're listening to the Dark Energy Podcast. <laughs> I reckon that's how you open a show properly. That was, that was the new track from Demon Boy called uh, Horrifying. And as always, welcome to the Dark Energy Podcast. Uh, my name's Drew. I'm not your host for this evening. I'm just going to sit back, take care of the live chat, and let our host do the talking for us. So without further ado, Mr. Adam Greenwood, over to you, my friend. Welcome, one and all. I'm speaking to you from the Robin Hood experience in the heart of Nottingham. I am Adam Greenwood, the owner and resident Robin Hood. And I'm talking this evening to Father Lionel Fanthorpe. And now, Lionel, uh, you're, you're best known to me and probably to many of our listeners as the host of Fortean TV. But obviously you've had a, mu- a much longer and more varied career. So perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself to begin with. I would be delighted if we sort of go back to my first job. I was still at school when I started. I was going in part-time. I was a dental technician or a dental technician's apprentice. Oh. And, uh, one, uh, you know, learning how to make false teeth for people who needed them. And the guy I was with, uh, we used it in those days, tell you how long ago it was, um, it was about 1950, and we still used vulcanite as a basis instead of plastic for the dentures we were making. And we had a very long laboratory, and my friend Alan, who was the uh, ex-army dental technician who was teaching me the trade, would say to me when we were sitting doing something with a a little piece of stuff on the bench, putting teeth into a plastic mould, he would suddenly say, oh, Lionel, go back and look at the vulcanizer for me. So I would trot a good 20 yards to the other end of the lab, check that the vulcanizer was not exceeding its 100 pounds per square inch, trot back and say to Alan, Everything's fine, sir. It's 98 or whatever it is, uh, pressure. And he would then carry on with dismal work. And then he'd send me back again. 
And I said to him one day when we'd got to know each other well and we were friends rather than boss and apprentice, Alan, why are you so concerned about the vulcanizer? And he said, well, when I was in North Africa in the dental corps, we had one blow up and it down nearly killed us. He said, oh, dear. which weighs a good two kilograms, blew up into the air and came down on a sort of whistling curved trajectory. And he said, our dental officer grabbed me and another technician and flung us flat into the sand with him <laughs> and shouted, keep still <laughs> and the lid landed about five yards away from where these three dental men were, were lying and he said i've never trusted vulcanizers since that's why it's at one end of the lab and we are at the other that'd um, be quite an embarrassing obituary wouldn't it killed by false teeth <laughs> <laughs> killed by false teeth <laughs> bitten by false teeth and uh, or vulcanized thoroughly <laughs> so when i um, when I'd been there for a few years, and I'd, uh, I, I could still make a set if I needed them, or if a friend wanted one and couldn't afford a <laughs> normal source. Um, I went on from a writing job, and I worked for one of those lovely local grocery firms that... Um, I'm sorry, we appear to have lost Lionel. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we're back again now. Oh, are, are you we, okay? Are we back? Yeah, we're back. Sorry, again. sorry, yes. Okay. Sorry. Are you? Oh, I think the right. And out from the old-fashioned family. Most, are you okay? Yeah. yeah. I Worked, think we are now. Yes. Yeah. One of those old-fashioned family grocers. It was called Hamilton's, and it was down in Church Street in a little town called Deerham. One of my friends on the staff there used to go out and take the customers' orders, and then. The two ladies who worked in the shop with us would make up those orders when he brought them in, and then they'd go into a box, and I'd pop them into the van and zoom out and deliver them. And I did that for a few years, and it was uh, it was a good thing. You got to know people, and uh, you did your best to help them as you went through. And then I did a complete change and got into journalism. And uh, there was a little weekly paper which was called the Norfolk Chronicle. And it was run by Sir Thomas Cook of Cook's Travel Agency because in those days, which was back in the very early 50s still, uh, he was the MP for North Norfolk. And so he, he owned this little local newspaper, which was really there to help him get elected and stay elected. And I always remember he was uh, also chairman of the magistrates at one of the local courts. And it was part of my duty as a reporter to go to the local court and take down everything that happened in the particular cases. And I was just typing it up when I got back to the office and Sir Thomas himself turned up and said, uh, Fernthorpe, what have you got down there? I said, uh, it's the court case, sir. Oh, let me see that. Oh, dear. Um, now, take this down. Sir Thomas Cook, chairman, said, and it was nothing like what he'd written. <laughs> so and, completely uh, unbiased reporting then. Yeah, that was a that was a good fifty odd years ago, and uh, when I'd sort of finished that journalism part of my career, I got into teaching, and then finished up, you know, going up through the the ranks as you do when you're teaching. Finished up as headmaster, and that was what brought me to Cardiff. And uh, I had a school called uh, Glyn Deru High School, which my Welsh is very limited, but I think it meant Oak Valley. So it was a, it would have been, in England would have been the Oak Valley High School. And uh, I, was, uh, I was head there for 10 or 11 years. And I must tell you one little episode from that that I found very amusing. It was in an area of Cardiff called Ely, which had a reputation for being rather tough. And I didn't know that when I took the school over. <laughs> and I was uh, been there perhaps three or four weeks. And as I drove in, parked my car, I saw that there was a very dubious looking character in the playground, surrounded by my, now my students were aged 11 to 18, and he was surrounded by teenage girls. And I thought, I would not like you in the proximity of my daughters and I don't want you in the proximity of my students so I strolled across and he was wearing what he fondly imagined to be street fighters clothes and uh, 
I walked across and saw he was a drug dealer and he was giving free samples to the girls. Told him in no uncertain terms to get out of my school and not ever return. And I could see him looking down at what he fondly imagined to be his street fighter's outfit, <laughs> looking at me wearing a suit as a teacher does. And I could read his mind. I am a tough guy. This thing is only a teacher. So when I told him to go, he laughed and spat at me. And that was when he discovered that I'm a Dan Grade martial arts instructor. <laughs> he didn't look quite so tough as he lay whimpering on the playground. And my parting shot to him was, uh, oh, should you ever spit at me again, my boy, it'll be your teeth. <laughs> and then you um, could have made him some new ones. Yeah, I could, have, I could have made him some more. Yeah, that would have been very appropriate. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, I also, on the way through, did some broadcasting and some lecturing and all sorts of other things that, you know, you very kindly said you remembered 40 and TV. <laughs> that was a highlight in my career. And uh, now, I, more or less, I said I shall be 85 next birthday, and I've more or less in, retired and uh, greatly enjoying the company of my family. In fact, I'm in my daughter's house now doing this broadcast, and she's sitting beside me ready to help if I get anything wrong technically. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it sounds like you've got more technical support than the, than the rest of us. Um, I understand that you, you spent a period of time, along with your wife, I believe, writing uh, horror, horror novels? Oh, yes. Or, we, horror, horror pulp novels? Mis mysteries of various oh, mysteries. And, uh, uh, you know, the unsolved mysteries of the kind that we did on 14 TV. Yeah. And, uh, yes, Patricia is a wonderful co-authoress. We married in 1957, and we celebrated our diamond wedding in 2017, and our next anniversary, all being well, will be our 62nd wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Uh, thank you. And uh, so we had two marvellous daughters, and uh, one of whom was looking after Dad now. <laughs> <laughs> computer goes wrong. And they both do wonderful things. And, uh, Stephanie's a clinical engineer. She designs and builds wheelchairs. And Fiona helps the deaf. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, she's our other daughter who lives in Gloucester. And I'll tell you a little story about her. She was helping one young man called Sam. And uh, Sam was only 11 when she took over helping him with his hearing problem. And uh, she helped him to get through his GCSE, helped him with his A-levels. Then he turns around to her and says, uh, you know, through their sign language, could I apply for university? So she helped him with his university applications and got an invitation to go down to Oxford with him. So down they trot, and the uh, the interview had to go through her with the sign language for Sam. And at the end of about half an hour, the admissions tutor said, you can tell Sam we are delighted to offer him a place. So she signals this, very happy and excited. Then this admissions tutor turns around to Fiona and says, could we possibly offer you a three-year contract as an assistant tutor to look oh, up the Sam while he's here? Well, we want a thing to put on your CV. He's now got his degree. But what a thing to put on your CV. My last post, oh, assistant tutor at Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Not many people can claim that one, can they? No, no uh, but yeah. it wasn't what she went down there for. She went down there to help. <laughs> so... Um, so so, that gives so us obviously in, in most people's minds, you'll, you will be associated with mysteries and the, the unexplained. What drew you into that world in the first place? Well, when I was at school, um, amazing that I later became a school teacher. Uh, I hated school when I was a boy. And I would skip out whenever possible if it was something like Latin or algebra that was planned, which I did not enjoy at all, and hide in the library. It was a very old-fashioned school building with those great big library stacks where you could hide from the master who was on duty in the library. And uh, as I used to dodge the Latin and the algebra, I would go and hide in the library and read whatever book was reachable as I sat quiet, avoiding the eye of the library supervisor. And it was there where I read Jules Verne and H.G. Wells in my teens. And it gradually occurred to me that what if some of these fictional mysteries 
were paralleled in the real world. And it was reading H.G. Wells and Jules Verne that got me interested in mysteries. Ah. So you, you spent a fair amount of time, I believe, having watched an interview recently, uh, writing writing novels on a reel-to-reel tape recorder around mysteries and that, oh, that kind of thing? Yes. Well, yes. When, I, when I was well, first got um, into what we might call the writing world at any degree of sort of speed and demand, I was working for a company called John Spencer & Co. in Hammersmith, and they were bringing out paperbacks, which in old money were one and sixpence each. <laughs> they paid me 25 quid for doing a 50,000 word novel, which worked out at about 10 bob a thousand in old currency. <laughs> and they were so demanding, I couldn't keep up with it. But I was doing my ordinary job at the same time. I never depended fully on my writing. And it occurred to me that... Uh, my mother, who was a shorthand typing instructor and was very good at it, um, if I could get a recorder and do some uh, recordings, if I just simply talked into the microphone, told the story to the microphone, that uh, mum would type them up for me. And she did, for one, and Patricia did a few as well. And uh, we got one or two other friends involved in it and bought two or three tape recorders, the old-fashioned reel-to-reel jobs. And when I got in from a day's work at whatever I was doing as my full-time living, I would then record a, a tape and Pat would zoom off with it to the, the nearest of our transcribers. And uh, we were able to do, because Spencer's Badger books were asking for so many, we did well over 100 with them, perhaps 150, um, they, they'd want one in a week. And, wow. Um, and we got them done in a week because if uh, if you uh, you know if you're a writer and there's a publisher actually demanding the next book, you think, wow! If I sit up all night recording this tape, I will. <laughs> One of the notorious things about some of those early books that I did for Badgers for Spencers was that they would sometimes be um, a, a, an extremely rapid ending, and. Uh, what happened was this, if I wasn't feeling too tired, I could get maybe 10, 15,000 words on a reel. If I was tired, I'd be lucky if I got 1,000 words on a reel. So I had no idea of how far I was in the 50,000 oh, right. words. So well, I went round, or Patricia went round and collected the, the typed work from the tape. Now, we sometimes go to find that I'd done a, a pretty packed reel and thinking I'd still got five or six thousand words to go, I came back, put the pages together, and found there were forty nine thousand. So I then had to finish the story oh dear. in a thousand words. And we got some amazing endings. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the bad guy sort of walks off the roof because there's no other way of getting rid of him quickly. I was about to ask how many ended with a meteor hitting the earth and just wiping everything out. Yeah. <laughs> So, well, that, presume, that would have presumably been, at the same time, sorry. So, presumably at the same time you were starting to investigate mysteries, how tempted were you to draw your research into the, the stories? Was there, is, was there much overlap between the fiction and the non-fiction? Oh, I think there was. Hmm. Yes. Um, just as I started with H.G. Wells and Jules and back as a young teenager in the school library, so by reading and enjoying things like H.G. Wells' Tales of Mystery and so forth, I began thinking, well, this, this maybe could have existed in the real world. This might be a real unsolved mystery. And so I went on from that to when I came across what I found to be a fascinating mystery, I would write it into a piece of fiction. And uh, they, they sort of interbred the fact with the fiction. An example of that would be the one of our most recent books, which is The Mysteries of Joan of Arc. And how that all got started, we were just thinking about doing a, a sort of serious non-fiction account of her. When we came across um, what we were looking on the internet, 
a tombstone which bore the slogan, Here lies Lord Robert of Armoise and his wife, the Lady Joan. And this was dated some 40 years or more after Joan was supposed to have been burnt at the stake. Ah. And so we did a piece of faction instead of writing the serious history. Uh, we imagined that this really was the tombstone of, uh, of Robert of Armoise and Joan. And that what had happened was that he was um, a real character, a, a huntsman as well as a, a, a fearless warrior. And riding on a hunt one day, he heard sounds of distress coming from the other side of a hedge. And he rode over there to see what was happening. And there was this incredibly brave little teenage girl with no weapon other than a shepherd's staff fighting off a pack of wolves that were coming after her lambs. And Robert being Robert, is he about the size of Schwarzenegger and as, um, as strong as a man could wish to be, leaps off the horse, seizes his big double-headed battle axe, and the wolf pack is no more. He lays three out at a blow. Uh -huh. The others decide they're not taking him on. Then he's so impressed by this pretty little girl's courage that he decides he'd like to marry her. And as they did in those days, he trots round to see her parents, or he assumes are her parents, the Ark family, and uh, I would like to marry your daughter. And my Lord, we would be honoured. But she's gone off to lead the army. She's been called up to lead the army. And so he does the next best thing to get close to her. And he assembles a dozen or so of the best of his warriors at uh, Armoise, which is close to Rouen, and also joins the army with his detachment. And without saying a word to Joan or even approaching her, they ride a few yards away on her flank. And in the first three battles where she comes to no harm, it's because Robert and his lads are defending her flank. In the fourth battle, where she is captured, Robert gets a, a very nasty head wound from behind. He falls on the battlefield as if dead. Joan is then captured when he and his men are not there to defend her. And by the time he recovers, he hears that she is about to be burned at the stake in Rouen. So again, gathering his troops, one of whom is a brilliantly skillful blacksmith armorer, and another is an alchemist. The alchemist has powder, which if thrown into flame, creates thick black smoke. They pop into uh -huh. the Ruong mortuary and say they're looking for the body of a cousin who ran away, teenage girl. They find a poor little beggar girl in the mortuary. Robert said, yes, that's my cousin. Uh, we'll take her away and bury her, and we'll leave a few gold coins with the uh, f funeral manager there. They take the body of this little teenage beggar girl under the horse blankets. The armourer has her concealed. In comes the alchemist with his black smoke powder. Huge cloud of black smoke. Armourer goes in, snip, snip, snip. Joan is free, and the little dead beggar girl is chained up and still under the thick black smoke. Joan is now alive and well and under the blanket and they vanish. Then she and Robert get married and the uh, her enemies, believing her now to be dead, hold a retrial as we know we're back in the history part now and she is proclaimed innocent so that if anybody catches the Lady Joan of Armoise, and says, aren't you Joan of Arc? She said, yes, but I've been pronounced innocent after you thought I was dead. <laughs> and they, lived, they lived happily together for the next 40 odd years. And that tombstone can be found um, on the internet. Excellent. I, I love the idea of meshing um, known, known fact with plausible fiction like that to create, create new stories. Do you personally have a favourite mystery? Yes, I would say that. Oh, I'm sorry, Lionel. We seem to have lost you again for a moment. 
favourite mystery. Ah, ah, is yes, you're back. Sorry, Dutton. just a favourite oh. mystery. Yes, sorry. Okay, yeah. right. I would say that my favourite mystery is the story of Rennes le Chateau down in the south of France, and the outline of it is that. Oh, I think we've lost you again, Lionel. Back in the nineteenth of the nineteenth century. Okay. Yep. Yeah. One, two, three, right. <laughs> yep, we're back. Rennes le Chateau. There was a priest there named Belanger Saunier. And the stipend at the living of Rennes, at the Church of St. Mary Magdalene, was six, the equivalent of six pounds a year. Well, even in the 1880s, you are not going to be able to eat enough to stay in one place on six pounds a year. And Beranger depended enormously on the generosity of his parishioners, who were by no means rich themselves. And he would, when he did a parochial visit, he'd have breakfast with you, he'd have lunch with a truly <laughs> evening meal with me in the course of his uh, parochial visits. And then, quite suddenly, everything changes out of all recognition. And he has money that he just shares and shares and shares. And people who provided him with a a simple meal of perhaps you know, bread and butter and cheese and a glass of milk, find they've been invited up to this new manor house that he's built in Rennes and uh, that they're having a five-course meal with wine between every course. And he treats them so well, if anybody's got housing problems, Belanger Sonia would have the house repaired for them. He's a real financial father figure to the village for years and this went on until his death in rather mysterious circumstances in 1917 there's a lot of suspicion that he was poisoned but that was the the heart of the mystery was that an impoverished village priest up at Rennes suddenly becomes the richest man in the south of France mystery is what did he find, or who put him up to it, or who was supporting him? And one of the uh, possible solutions, because we've written books on him and articles on him and I've broadcast about him, yes. one of the suggestions is that way back in the, the days of the Templars, you know, before they were destroyed in 1307, that they were helping a religious group who were known as the Cathars, who appeared to have acquired some very old and immensely valuable religious treasures. When the Cathars were destroyed, it seems that they passed it to the Templars. And the Templars had a castle down near Rennes, and it looks as if that Templar treasure, which was originally Cathar religious treasure, was hidden, and some of it was transferred to be hidden in the church of St. Mary Magdalene. And that that was what Beranger Saunier found. And that was what he, he kept popping across to Spain as if he was taking a few bits of jewellery at a time and selling them under <laughs> an assumed name in an assumed yeah. place. But he has always fascinated me because I, I'm, I'm interested, one, in what he might have found and two, in... What happened to him at the end when he died in rather mysterious circumstances? Absolutely. Uh, do you believe the theory that he he left clues to the to his secret in the architecture of the of the church? I know that's something that's been suggested a few times. Oh, yes, yes. Um, there are all sorts of fascinating clues down there, and the the way that the that the church is designed was the other argument in the mystery is that what he had discovered was that Jesus had been married to Mary Magdalene and that they had had children and when Jesus was crucified Mary with the help of Joseph of Arimathea who was very wealthy and powerful and in with the Roman authorities had smuggled her across to the south of France and that is why so many churches in and around the Wren area are dedicated to St. Mary Magdalene. Indeed. The, the, uh, 
the theory was that in order to keep this quiet, the church authorities were bribing Sodier not to say anything about the marriage of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, of which he had some incontrovertible evidence. And one of the interesting pieces there is that the generally accepted theory concerning the Gospel of St. John is that when he refers to the disciple whom Jesus loved, He's referring to himself, meaning that he just had a specially close relationship with Jesus, that he was the favorite disciple. But there have been some uh, way out uh, theologians who have suggested that John is referring to Mary Magdalene without mentioning her by name, so that the disciple whom Jesus loved is not the good Saint John, but it was Mary, who was the only female disciple it was the wife of Jesus and there's all sorts of one that uh, Sonia was being bribed to keep his evidence out of sight uh, possibly eventually they got sick of bribing him and decided to decided um, to, yeah, to terminate take, take him away. Yeah. now I was going to come on to this, this later on but we've had a question come, come through on the, the feed and you're referring to Sonia the priest you are obviously a, a priest yourself you're a Father Lionel Fanthorpe and the question is, in your role as a priest, have you ever been called upon to perform exorcisms? Oh, yes. Yes, more than once. And uh, it's, unfortunately, I, it saddens me that the, the church is, um, not quite sure how to express it, but it's dubious about exorcism. There's a lot of doubt uh, about whether exorcism should be conducted. It's reluctant to commit itself to... It reluctant, a perfect way to express it. And uh, that I suppose it feels that if it once suggests that exorcism is a worthwhile duty for a priest and is important for certain people who are in trouble and in difficulty because they think they are under some sort of spiritual attack, that if a priest goes along and conducts an exorcism, he is more or less basically saying that there are dark, evil, psychic forces or that there are ghosts, which is not part of mainstream theology. And uh, I, I quote you one case where um, I was walking back between the house and the church several years ago now, and... Uh, Guy runs up to his garden gate as I pass it, grabs me by the arm and says, I need a priest. So uh, if you're a priest and somebody says, I need a priest, <laughs> you stop what you're doing because he was obviously in a desperate state. And uh, I went indoors with him and he told me what the problem was. He had remarried after the death of his first wife and she had left money um, to him to give to their children and he hadn't done it he ah. knew it himself and he said that she was haunting him and that he had now found money elsewhere which he'd given to the children as she had originally requested in her will but that she was still haunting him and she was buried in the western cemetery in Cardiff and he asked, would I go with him and bless the grave and tell her that he had now done what she wanted? <laughs> and the poor guy was so unutterably distressed that I said, yes, I would. So I went up with him to Western Cemetery and he showed me her grave. And so I stood beside the grave and said some prayers and said that uh, she could now rest in peace in the new world and that he had done what she wanted and that all was well. And about a week later, he comes around to see me and says, everything is absolutely fine since uh, I did that for him and that her spirit has not been troubling him anymore. Now, of course, we can explain all of this psychologically. He obviously felt, if we take it from that angle, he felt guilty in that he had, as it were, robbed his children by taking the money that she had wanted them to have. He had then felt so bad about this that he tried to put it right. And still, in his guilt-laden state, 
he had imagined that her spirit was still pestering him to do what he had already done. So by taking him up there, it, he evidently believed in paranormal beings and uh, he equally believed that if a priest did something to help him and uh, prayed for that spirit to rest that it would go away so that the whole thing could be explained psychologically rather than paranormally but i suppose it could be argued that if his belief in the fact that you saying those prayers would make things calm down that worked one way or another so ultimately does the does the technical science of the situation i suppose matter what mattered is that you you said those prayers and things improved yes i would i would put it that way this is this is um you know you you can't be absolutely definitive about why it worked but i made him happy again <laughs> you know that it worked absolutely you can if you can ease pain and pressure and help someone to feel better that's what you're here for lovely so to return to the world of mysteries um i suppose this is a two-part question so the first first part would be are there any well-known mysteries that you expect to be uh, resolved in your lifetime that you expect there to be a, a definitive answer found for well i would think from the quite recent television series about Oak Island off the coast of Nova Scotia, which is one that I've written two books on, and uh, Patricia and I have been over there and examined it. Oh, yes. I've spoken to dear old Dan Blankenship, who now sadly passed away, but knew him 20-odd years ago. He made it to 90 before he passed. And uh, I always remember, uh, if I just go over the basis of the mystery, is that yes, three, please boys, three boys back in 1795, um, names were uh, Smith and Vaughan and McGuinness and their parents in Nova Scotia had given the kids a day off because life was very hard there. You were either a fisherman or a lumberjack or a farmer and it demanded enormous amounts of both mental and physical work and if the parents couldn't take a day off at least the boys could so they said to the boys take a day off. The boys went out in the boat to explore Oak Island, which was then uninhabited. It's about two miles long, a mile wide, and was at one time covered in oak trees, which have now all gone, but hence the name of Oak Island. While the boys were exploring, they came across the top of a, a, a shaft or a, a hole in the ground, about 13 feet across, and it had settled as such shafts do settle when they've been filled in and dug and, and filled in and of course it's 1795 and if i think we were teenagers then our first thought would be pirate treasure absolutely so rush home and get some spades and pickaxes and just the three kids on their own they get down 10 feet which is quite commendable <laughs> and at the 10 foot level they found a platform of oak logs which had been driven into the very hard sides of the shaft. All that the boys had done was to pull out some fairly loose backfill. So they prized up these logs, thinking the treasure must be under here. And it wasn't, just more backfill. They decided this is more than three of us can do. And a little while later, they got an, an adult company going, dozen and more men going over there. That group got down to 60 feet, and then there was a platform of oak logs at every 10 feet, and then the tunnel flooded. And it has been flooded, causing all sorts of difficulties for would-be explorers from that day to this. But now there are millionaire brothers who are the boys who made the recent television series on Oak Island. And... Uh, I can remember that when we were there 20 years before them, met Dan Blankenship, who was a real hero. Uh, Dan gave up his contracting business in order to devote the rest of his life to getting the Oak Island treasure out of the shaft. And uh, when we met him, he took me to see Borehole 10X, which he had dug and which went down well over 100 feet and then he told me what had happened to him. He'd gone down um, in a sort of 
stanchion device and his son was at the top operating the equivalent of what you'd have on an old-fashioned well where you wind the, the bucket up and down. Yeah. And Dan suddenly heard the sides of the shaft collapsing above him. And he shouts up to his son, unless you want to be an orphan boy, get me out of here. <laughs> no! And he came up with just split seconds to spare his son, put everything into saving Dan's life. And uh, so I've actually stood on the side of that shaft with Dan, as he pointed down to me, told me what had happened to him. And then we uh, talked to Dan Hensky, who was another of the survivors of the original Oak Island team who had worked with Dan Blankenship. And they just told us in detail how they had dug and explored and explored and dug and always been defeated by this flood water. They could not beat the flood water. Now, what we're up against when we're surveying the Oak Island mystery is who had the technical skill to build that shaft and why had they dug it? What was concealed at the bottom? And almost I wondered whether this could be linked to the Rennes Chateau mystery and if some of that sacred treasure from Rennes taken by the Templars, when the Templars were attacked by Philip IV, you know, Philip La Belle, who set out to destroy the Templars, if their fleet, which had been at La Rochelle, had not been caught by Philip's men, which it wasn't, they escaped, had they made their way over as far as they could go to get this treasure as far as possible, from the clutching hands of Philip Le Bell and had buried it, had built and then buried the ship. Because if we think of that wonderful Templar castle in the Middle East, the one called Crac de Chevalier, which is a piece of superb military engineering, men with that architectural skill could do a tunnel or a shaft just as easily as they could put up a wonderful castle. So it could have been the work of the Templars. Ah, splendid. Uh, one of the documentaries I saw on the subject, I, I believe it was one that you contributed to yourself, um, implied that the flooding was a result of some kind of booby trap uh, oh, yes. to prevent people taking this out. It was uh, quite undoubtedly something that had been deliberately put there. And it was not until one of the expeditions and they the one of the 19th century expeditions dug through not only a platform of oak logs but underneath it there was um what we would describe i think that just as a waterproof shell that um it had been covered in the same chemical compound that was used in the days of the sailing ships to make the hull waterproof and when this expedition going through it they released the water from the flood tunnels now had the original diggers designers and builders of that shaft intended to come back and take the treasure they would have known exactly where their flood tunnels were and before going down they would have blocked off the flood tunnels so they, they'd made it so that only they could come back for their, right. their very treasure to get be. Right. So how far do you think we are off a definitive answer to that? Sounds sounds like with everything that's going on, it could be you know within the next couple of years, I'd have thought. Oh, it could. Yes, I, I think we're going to get a solution to the the Oak Island mystery. And uh, I, still, I hope I'm still around because having known Dan Blankenship, who... Sadly, as it passed away while these latest investigations were going on, but he made it to 90. And uh, if I can do as well as he did, then I hope to be around when the uh, when they finally reach the treasure and confirm my suspicion that it's religious treasure and that it came from Rennes Le Chateau. Excellent. So, so that could be two mysteries solved in in one. It in fact, could be two solved yes. in one. And then I, I suppose the, the flip side to that question, what I'll call the part two of the question is, are there any mysteries out there 
that you genuinely hope are never solved because the mystery itself, the, the question, is far more interesting than any possible answer could be. Well, what I put in that category is the, the, um, the mystery of the 1872 uh, discovery of the Mary Celeste. And uh, the, the great thing there is that the, the, uh, the accompanying ship, the Dia Gracia, overtook the Mary Celeste. And clearly there wasn't anybody on board for the way it was tacking against the, uh, against the prevailing weather conditions. So the captain goes, sends his first mate and two sailors over there to see what's happening. And they find that the, the ship, the Mary Celeste, which is carrying a cargo of industrial alcohol, um, has no people on board. But because the captain of the Dia Gracia knew the Mary Celeste captain, they were friends, and uh, he knew that he had taken his wife and two-year-old child aboard with him, and that there were eight crew members, or there were 11 human beings on board the Mary Celeste. The lifeboat had apparently been launched because some of the deck rail had been knocked out to let the lifeboat go down into the water. And the lifeboat was by no means big enough for 11 people. It would have been hopelessly overcrowded. It was a, a sort of a six-man boat. Oh, and yes. So the theory is that for some reason, known only to the captain and crew who were on board when they abandoned the Mary Celeste, for some reason they felt that the ship was about to explode or sink and that it would be a death trap to remain on board. And so flimsy as the lifeboat was, overcrowded as the lifeboat was, that was what they did. And that the, I suppose, the pragmatic explanation is that just there near the Azores, where there are tides and currents and strong winds, an overcrowded lifeboat would not last very long. There's also what looks like the remains of a cable trailing from the stern of the Mary Celeste, which looked as if it might have been attached to the lifeboat, and that the intention was that when conditions improved, if the Mary Celeste did not explode, which is what I think they were afraid of, yes. then they would simply have hauled in the cable and got back on board. Now, all the hatch covers were open. The cargo was industrial alcohol, and notoriously that stuff manages to seep its way out of wooden barrels. Now, if he'd packed the hold with thousands of gallons of industrial alcohol, which he had done, and if in the course of the first few days of the voyage, the movement of the sea, the waves and the tides had joggled those barrels into one another, there would have been a mass of gaseous alcohol filling the hold. Now, if that gas had popped at one point and blown off a hatch cover, then the natural thing, he'd never carried alcohol before. And if he had been an older, more experienced captain who had shipped alcohol before, he would have known that it tended to do that and that there was nothing to worry about. Just open the hatch covers and let the gas out. But because he was afraid, and especially with wife and child on board, that the ship was going to blow up, they launched the lifeboat and got onto the lifeboat and the lifeboat sank. Now, there are so many other possibilities. How do you get 11 people off a ship like the Mary Celeste? And some of the theories that I have heard uh, when I've discussed it with other friends like yourselves, that uh, it, it could have been uh, an extraterrestrial in, uh, looking for human specimens. <laughs> uh, in fact, I actually wrote a science fiction story in which baby Briggs had grown up with these aliens on their <laughs> and uh, had eventually become 
uh, a highly honoured ruler among them because they recognised as he grew up he was brighter than they were. <laughs> And that he had saved the people who'd abducted him. Uh, another possibility is that it was piracy. There is even a, a dark and very nasty theory that uh, Oliver DeVoe, who was the captain of the Dea Gratia, um, had actually been an incredibly brutal and selfish man. I think there's no truth in this whatever. And that the Dea Gratia... Uh, had come up with the Mary Celeste, had murdered the crew, the captain and the family, and thrown them overboard, and then left the Mary Celeste floating for a day or two so that they could pick it up and claim the salvage money. There was nearly uh, £2,000 paid in salvage money. And if we imagine what £2,000 was worth in 1872... Absolutely. It could have been a temptation. But... As he and Briggs, Devoe and Briggs, have been good friends, and there's not a trace of um, any crime in Devoe's career uh, or of the De Gracia, that I don't think that there's any likelihood that that's it. But I like to leave that one open. Was it extraterrestrials? Was it pirates? Um, did they sail through one of those, you know, the things that the advanced physicists are telling us about now? Which parallel universes and absolutely uh, yeah did did uh, did the mary celeste sail into and out of a parallel universe and that's where captain briggs and his family disappeared to i suppose leading back to your your joan of arc novel there has been a lot of fiction about about the mary celeste and therefore some things that people think they know about the situation are actually fictional elements added later i mean i understand that the story that uh, a meal was laid out and looked like it had been abandoned is is a, a later invention. I, is that right? Yeah, there is, sure, sir. There is some doubt about some of the alleged facts, but one of the one of the facts which is very strange, which suggests a sudden abandonment. A great many of had left. You know, if if we were seamen, then we have certain precious objects that we take with us that yes. a little bit of money that we've had stored that goes with us in our sea chest and other things that we would use and need um, weaponry for instance if you had a pistol you would keep it in your sea chest rather than strolling around the deck with it stuck in your holster uh, and so the fact that these sea chests had been hurriedly abandoned does rather make you worry why they left at such speed that they wouldn't have had time to take their treasures with them. Hmm. I, su I suppose the the theory if they were they were planning to come come back soon afterwards and it yes, was just a know. precaution that could help that. Before yeah. I come on to my final question, uh, we've had another one from the from the chat. So what's the most significant or interesting mystery that has come to light within within the last decade or, or so? Like the a, a new a new one that you know, ha, has recently started to be discussed. Right, let me just have a quick think about that one. Um, I would say that of the of the mysteries um, which have been examined and not been investigated as thoroughly as we would have liked them to be is the very strange business um, at uh, Glozell. Now, there was a young but I actually met the bloke who had found this mystery way back in 1924, when he was 17. I met him in the 70s. Okay. And his name was Emile Fradin. And what had happened was that they had lost one of their cattle on this little farm near Glozelle. His father had sent him, he was just a boy in those days, teenager. His father had sent him to see if he could find it. And he found it had fallen through what looked like a perfectly normal field and just vanished. So he 
calls his father and two or three of the guys who work with them. They go to the place where the field is just sort of opened as if there's a cavern underneath it. And they manage to get this poor frightened beast out with ropes and uh, slings under it. And it isn't hurt. Okay. So it, it goes back and grazes with the rest of the herd. But young Neil, and who I actually met him in the 70s, and when you think that this took place in 1924, yes. um, young Emil told me what he'd seen down there and what he'd found down there. And it was the most amazing subterranean uh, building that he... And it was full of strange artefacts. There were stones with carvings on and... Um, it looked like something that might have come from centuries ago, or even further than that, back in the days Stone Age. And the Glozell mystery has never been solved and has intrigued me. Um, there was a huge row between various learned members of different archaeological societies, some of whom said that Emil Fradin had made the things himself. And the two sides had no time for each other's arguments. When we went and met him and saw the place, I would put myself on Emil Fradin's side, that he found something ancient and genuine. Those were not made up by tricksters in the 1920s. That was something very mysterious. But who were the people who had made Glozell. Well, that's one I've not come across before. I'm definitely going to be looking looking into more that more into that later this evening. Okay. But I suppose my, my final question, and it may well be on the minds of of other Fortean TV fans. One of the things that I remember most fondly about the show is how you would end each one with a with a song summarising what had been in the in the episode, and you were usually accompanied by someone you introduced as your good friend, and then whatever their name may be. Yes. How did those come? come about and well what we did when the producers directors uh, said we are going to you know wherever it may be and we would like to do the mystery of the uh, the oak island money pit or we'd like to do the mystery of Ren le chateau or we'd like to go off somewhere else and look at the castles and that gave me a it gave me a week's notice and that gave me a week in which to write the song. <laughs> and uh, one of my most regular accompanists uh, was a great pal of ours who used to live in Claude Road, where we still live. Okay. And uh, his name was Alf Grimmins. And uh, Alf and I would then, because we lived pretty well as next door neighbours, would be able to rehearse the song before we got called out there to go and play it. Excellent. I remember an Alf and a, a moose and a peg. Yes, uh, if for any reason, if for any reason Alf couldn't get there, um, then the producers would find another guitarist who would come and accompany me. And I'm, I'm so glad you remembered the songs. I love doing them. They were my favourite parts of the show. Oh, well, I, mine too, I'm sure, sure for many others. It's, well, it's um, been a gen Sorry. It's been a genuine pleasure talking to you this evening, Lionel. And... I, I hope that we're going to stay in touch and certainly if you're ever in Nottingham you're more than welcome to visit the Robin Hood experience and, like and that. see it for yourself. So, and now I'm going to hand back over to Drew. Excellent. Well, thank you for hosting that, Adam. That was awesome and thank you for being a guest on the show, Lionel. If you guys don't mind, I'm um, going to ask you to stay on for a few minutes uh, after, we, after we close out just to have a quick chat, if that's all right. Okay for me. Brilliant. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Excellent. So thank you very much both again. And just to let you guys know, our next show is next Sunday. We'll be talking to uh, Orly Stewart from Become a Living God. Uh, we've talked to E.A. Coetting before and she works with him and other black magicians too. So that should be about seven o'clock, I think. So you know, fingers crossed uh, everything works. So, <laughs> so with that, guys, I'm going to play two of our sponsor ads and then we shall see you next week. So the first one you're going to hear is uh, my good friend DJ Rockalypse, and the second one will be Bad Fish Merch, who do our um, t-shirts and hoodies and that sort of thing. So again, guys, thank you very much, and I shall see you all next time. <laughs>
in a minute, please come on again in a minute. Dark energy, dark music, DJ Rockalypse, keeping metal and rock alive in Nottingham. Visit facebook.com slash DJ Rockalypse 666. Have you ever thought that should be on a t-shirt? Well now it can. At Badfish Studio, we create one-of-a-kind t-shirts, hoodies and more from just £15. Get a favourite slogan, awesome picture or anything in between and wear it around town. It's less commitment than a tattoo. We can do full colour images or bold colour vinyl including metallic, leather and carbon fibre look. Glow in the dark, reflective and even rainbow or glitter for all you snazzy unicorns out there. Because we love you, the podcast community, we want to give you 10% off your order by using the code DE1. Oh, and if you are content creators, we have free merchandise options that will help you start making money from your labour of love. So shoot us a message on Facebook at Badfish Merch, Instagram at Badfish Studio, or fill in the form at www.badfishmerch.com. Badfish Studio, be unique, be Badfish. <laughs> 